So, Bookshop Barney, my name is Austin Williams, um, and we're going to be taking a look at Peter's book, uh, Revolution Betrayed, How Egalitarians Wrecked the British Education System. It's a 90-minute session. We're probably going to do about 60 minutes on UK drugs policy, and then we'll go on to the book. <laughs> That's all right, yeah? uh, but um, Peter is about the... Looking for the exit. <laughs> Peter's a, he's the only person I've done a second Barney with. I did the first one in 2009 when he was a child uh, <laughs> called The Broken Compass, How British Politics Lost Its Way. And if there was ever a more prescient book, uh, it'd be hard to find about looking at the, lack, the collapse of political principles and the, and the uh, lack of moral compass in British politics. Nobody uh, bought that either. <laughs> you'd be surprised. They'd be up, queuing up to get this signed up. This one uh, is looking at the history and the impact of educational policy uh, post-war in many effects uh, in, in this country and I thought I would like adopt the role of a student and what would a student do I thought I know I'd look at ChatGPT so I asked ChatGPT to write me a gag to lighten the mood okay you're ready for this why are comprehensive school graduations like a fine symphony pause because they feature students from all walks of life creating a harmonious and diverse blend of talent in the future, in the, in the future, that would be hilarious. Yeah. Uh, anyway, you had to be there. Right, so, um, I, I, and uh, speaking of, to people... It's all going to be like this. <laughs> no, no, just give me my moment. Uh, it'll be all you in a minute. Um, so, yeah, and I was reading a, a review, um, one of many reviews of your book, uh, Peter, as we were talking about earlier, on an education website, uh, and there was a certain Professor Colin McCaig who's Professor of higher, edu higher Education Policy at Sheffield Hallam University, who said, thank you, education website. You have read this, so thousands of us will never have to. Which, in many ways, unbeknown to him, is a summary of the Philistine collapse of educational standards that <laughs> Peter's talking about in his book. And is also ignorant of the fact that this is a damn good book. So I thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it to you. Uh, as Peter sold it to me earlier, it's not very long. Uh, which is not the best selling point, but actually it's, it's packed with information, really, really interesting, and uh, gave me much more insights than, than, I, uh, than I knew before. So this is a Barney, it gives you, you the opportunity, I'll have a bit of a chat with uh, Peter, he's going to have five minutes to present his case, like kind of sell you the book in some respects. Um, I'll have a bit of a Barney with him about some of the issues I've read in, in terms of the book, some questions that have arisen in my mind, just to kind of tease you out a bit more and give you, if you haven't read it yet, a bit more insight about the book, and then it's over to you for any comments or questions. So it doesn't have to be a question, but you can make a, an observation if you so wish. So, Peter, that was my introduction. Uh, over to you for your five minutes. Okay. Why do you need an educated population? Uh, we recently had a very good example of why you need an educated population, when the whole country plunged into an illiterate and foolish panic over COVID and there was almost no serious opposition to it. You don't just need an educated population, you need an elite which knows better and can stand up against the public mood and stand up against the pressure of the mob and not run with the flock. That's what you need that for, and we don't have it anymore, but when I was growing up in this country, we did. In fact, our education system was so good that I remember people saying that a set of English A-levels was the equivalent of a United States college degree. There was also a thing called the brain drain, which some very old and white-haired people here will remember, when the Americans spent an awful lot of money recruiting, particularly uh, for, for, for scientific work, uh, people trained and educated in this country, and many, many of them products of the state grammar schools, which then existed in all four parts of this country as a normal part of education available to anybody who could show that they had talent. And we abolished it. Uh, the government of the Labour government of 1964 to 1970 abolished in a series of strokes in, in Scotland almost overnight, in England more slowly, uh, something like, if you put the Scottish and the English and Welsh together, something like 17 or 1800 superb schools. No other educational reform I can find in the history of this country ever involved the actual destruction of good schools. But that did. They were systematically destroyed and they were merged with worse schools and made to follow lower standards. And within a very short period of time, it was evident to everybody in education, if they cared to look, that the effects of this had been disastrous. And the simplest way in which this showed was in the watering down of examinations because the new schools simply could not educate their pupils to pass the old ones. 
it's quite obvious and beyond belief. Anybody with any knowledge of university entrance, of the quality of education of undergraduates at universities, will tell you the same thing, that there has been a catastrophic decline in these standards ever since. It is measurable in various ways. Various people have attempted to do it. Durham University has tried to do it. The Engineering Council tried to do it. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's an excellent article called Drilled, Not Educated, some years ago in the, in, the, in the Times, which explains exactly how this happened. Anyway, as an act of deliberate policy, this country's government, first of all, destroyed good education. Secondly, when the opportunity might have arisen to put the, put the mistake right, did not do so, but continued it. The Conservative government, which came into office in 1970, continued with the policy and did nothing whatever to reverse it. So here we have an example of total irrationality in modern politics, for which we pay all the time, and which is increasingly difficult even to criticize. I doubt very much whether we have in this country the regenerative capacity to rebuild the many, many good things which we have destroyed in similar ways over the past 50 or 60 years. It might be that I am hopelessly pessimistic and I'm wrong about this, in which case this book is a manifesto for those of you who will be alive after I'm dead, who will try to put the grammar schools back. If it isn't possible, then at least there is a lesson here for anybody who cares to look in how not to make and implement policy in an advanced and civilized country. For that reason alone, I think everybody here should read it. I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. Very good, very good. Round of applause, please. <laughs> OK, I'm going to try this question out for you. So obviously, uh, a revolution betrayed uh, I assumed this was betraying your old left-wing uh, past, uh, Trotsky's book. Some the of you revolution. will know the title is partly stolen, yes. Yes, The Revolution Betrayed, it was, uh, looking at how the Bolshevik Revolution was kind of undermined by, uh, what can we call it, a communist elite, let's say. So I just wondered whether that was a conscious decision? It, it was involved. I, there are, I put a number of things into the titles of my books, which most people never notice, and that's all right, because I can always... I can always uh, take pleasure from the fact they haven't noticed them. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it, there is, a, there is, a, what, what actually, was, I was surprised by was how few people, and I know it's one of the great problems of being a trained Bolshevik, as I am, is that you feel con constantly uh, that most people in modern politics are clueless about all politics, because they have not had this training. And I find that in any effort to understand modern British politics, if you have no Marxist-Leninist background, you're lost. You can't know what to think. Yes, it is, but there, was a, there is another thing. This was an extraordinarily brief moment in this country's history, uh, during which children from poor homes, such as Alan Bennett, uh, the son of a co-op butcher, uh, such as Alan Rickman, the great Shakespearean actor, whose father was a, a house painter in Acton, uh, people who, who came from totally ordinary, poverty-stricken backgrounds, were lifted up to have the best education which could conceivably be provided by a wise and thoughtful state. And 20, more or less 20 years it existed. And it did revolutionize the country while it happened. And it did, it did lift astonishing numbers of people out of what would otherwise have been lives of frustration and waste uh, into, into lives of immense uh, productivity and uh, fully, uh, fully fulfilled talent. And the fact that this happened uh, tells you the really tragic thing about the betrayal of this revolution of how many people of an enormous ability and talent have had to see that talent wasted and squandered in their afterlives thanks to the destruction of those schools. And we now have, people always respond to, by saying, but, but you, 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 what is all this about selection? It's terribly cruel. Some people can't go, if you have an exam or, or any kind of test which allows people to go to a good school, some people will fail it. Well, yes, they will, and it is sad, and sometimes tragic, and sometimes mistaken. But how much immeasurably worse it is if you have a system, the system which is madly backed in this country by people who claim to be left-wing and socialist, a system where selection for the better schools in this country is conducted on the basis of the wealth of your parents. Well, you kind of... Uh, so you, you know, it, it, does, it does bring out... That, that does bring out the tross in me, this ridiculous thing. We, people who say they're in favour of, 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 of the poor and who, who claim to be socialists standing there and actually having the outrageous nerve to defend a system which keeps poor children with talent out of good schools because their parents don't have any money. Can you imagine the, the level of either personal, personal hypocrisy, personal hypocrisy or 
boneheaded stupidity which would enable someone to hold that position. I can't, I, I, it's unbelievable to me that people do. Okay, well, speaking of some boneheads, uh, we've got. Uh, Sorry about that, the, but you know, it's. it's the, the, this is selection. I know you're, you're playing to the audience, I know. But look, uh, Michael Young, remember him? Coined the phrase yeah. meritocracy. Yeah, yeah. You bang father, on father of Toby. Exactly. But we won't mention. You, know, you can't I have the father by the sins of the child, can you? But the. Um, <laughs> the, the <laughs> Uh, Great play of meritocracy in your in your book, and as you've hinted there yeah. very strongly, it's a contentious term. Let's be frank, and there may be some people here who might buy into it. Uh, some people applauded just because they were in a group and they felt they ought to. But ultimately, Michael Michael Young coined the phrase, uh, and then in his article about a year before he died, he said uh, down with meritocracy. Uh, Michael Sandel, I don't know whether you give him credit or not. Meritocracy is a justification for inequality. Anyway, you get the gist. You know the, you know the story. So I just wondered how you, how do you define it? Talk, talk us through a little bit of the book about how you define it, how you defend it. Well, Michael Young's uh, sort of almost uh, dystopian prediction of a, of a meritocracy yeah. was, I think, just false. It was n nothing of that kind was, was happening or, or likely to happen. The idea that people would, would the, the, the system of selection by ability would be so thorough that all the people who were at the bottom of society would, would have the terrible belief that they had, they had justly been relegated. The world is not so simple and, and, uh, and, and life is not so simple that that would ever happen. He was playing with the idea uh, for, the, for the sake of fun. In any case, it wasn't Michael Young uh, or people like him who, who actually wished above all things to destroy uh, academically selective schooling. It was communists uh, like Brian Simon uh, who had their own ideas about what sort of equality they wanted to see, uh, and who I have to say never, be uh, never believed or, or, or understood at the time that they were doing what they were doing, just how bad the effects would be. And I do sometimes wonder how many of the comprehensive pioneers of the 1940s and, uh, and 1950s would feel if they could see what had happened as a result. Certainly, um, uh, the, the actual the, 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 the inventor of the of, of the term comprehensive whose name has obviously slipped my mind at the moment but I'll, it'll come back to me in the moment he himself before he died uh, wrote that he was surprised by how uh, how f filled with regret he was at the destruction Graham Savage at the destruction of so many good grammar schools and uh, he, he was the, he was the person who actually invented the term and, and devised the first comprehensive system for what was then the London County Council Fine. Uh, so, look, in terms of your, uh, just uh, finish this point. In terms of the definition of um, meritocracy, premised on the opposition to egalitarianism in some ways, it's comprehensivism. I just, I just wondered how you build in fairness in terms of reflecting back on what you say in the book is how the original comprehensive did it, but how would you see fairness being built into well, a merit-based no, system? Uh, any, any society will have a, a top and a bottom. The question is how you decide who is at the top and who is at the bottom. Uh, you should first of all it, in, it, understand this is true rather than imagining that the utopia can ever exist in which everybody is totally equal in all ways because it doesn't ever exist. Uh, fascinating experience uh, which informed a lot of what I wrote here of living in the Soviet Union. And in fact, where I lived in, in communist Moscow in 1990 was a, an elite block of flats. My neighbours across the courtyard were the Brezhnev family uh, Yuri Andropov had lived there. It was full of senior KGB officers. It was a very nice block of flats, I have to tell you. Uh, I had 14-foot uh, ceilings, oak parquet floors, chandeliers, a view across Moscow. Officially, this was entirely equal to workers' flats in eastern Moscow, which were about a quarter of the size. Uh, officially, uh, the most equal society in the world was deeply unequal, and there will always be inequality in societies. It's a question of how it happens. In that society, it was secret. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it was protected behind often high fences or uh, people knew, poor, uninfluential people knew uh, not to go into those areas or trouble their, their, uh, their superiors because it would be very dangerous for them. It was a much more rigidly Im Im imposed and in fact dangerous form of inequality than, than any that we ever had here. So it, it, equality is unattainable. You have to accept that there will be inequality. Therefore, the question is how you manage inequality and how you do it most fairly. And I can't think of any fairer way of doing it than on merit. Okay, okay. Before I came in, somebody, somebody said to me, don't mention the word communist to Peter, he'll be off. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think I had. But anyway, uh, anyway so another question. I wasn't waiting. On, <laughs> so there's a, one quote. You actually quote a, you take a quote from the Times and you say, from the 1960s. You say, your average labour rebel, often the personal beneficiary of a selective education, 
dislikes grammar schools more than he does public schools. And you say that, and you say the hostility to that is beyond reason. I was wondering if you had a rational explanation which you talk about in the book quite well. There is a sort of rational explanation. Labour has long treasured a desire to destroy the, the private schools, uh, the, the fee charging schools. And the tr trouble with that ambition is that in a free country, it's impossible to cheat. Even if you manage to make such schools illegal in this country on British soil, uh, they would be set up abroad and the parents of the children involved would send them there. Uh, in any case, it would be, it seems to me, beyond the limits of any kind of, uh, of, of society with the rule of law and anything remotely resembling democracy if you actually made illegal a form of education which parents wanted for their children. So they can't do it, and on the, the occasions when they might have had the power to do it, so for instance, the 1945 to 51 Labour government when they had a gigantic majority, or indeed the 1966 70 government when they also had a, a large majority, and, and of course the Blair terror as well. Although they had the parliamentary power uh, to destroy and remove private schools, they never did because they knew it was, it was beyond them. So instead, uh, they, they decided that they would mount an attack on the ground schools as a, as, as a substitute, as a displacement activity. That seems to me to be the only rational explanation as to why so much passion was wasted uh, on, on, on such a stupid activity and one which was in, so counterproductive for so many of their own voters and supporters. Yeah, I, th I thought it was very similar to the, which still exists a bit, the, the hostility towards uh, private house, home owning versus council houses. There seems to be a bit of a... Well, I, 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 don't, I, sh I share some of these things. I'm very much against uh, the, <coughs> the fee charging schools. And I think ways should have been found to to incorporate them into a, into a, into a system very similar to the direct grant schools, which were a part of the grant school system, which only technical specialists now understand, but under which many very fine uh, private schools uh, took in without fees very large numbers of, of children from state primary schools who were qualified by uh, by intelligence and ability to go to them. Uh, something which which the Labour government of uh, 1974 abolished. So what about, you, you don't mention the Michaela schools, Catherine Burble Singh schools. I mean, you've written about it. In, in the I have. I mean, it's, as, I, as, I, as I say to Catherine Burble Singh, I, I don't like her school because I would, I, I would hate to go to it. Uh, <laughs> because but, of the discipline? Yeah, and all that stuff, no, no talking in the court. I, 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 almost any, people like me who are troublemakers by nature would, would hate it, but it's not a school for troublemakers. It's a school for, for, for the children of, of poor families living in Wembley uh, to whom she gives hope. And as a result, it's, it's, it's laudable. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it, it operates within our current education system, and particularly an examination system, which has astonishingly low standards. I'm sure that Catherine Burble Singh and Michaela School could, could cope with a much higher standard of education if they were able to educate to it. But the, the, the examination system is, is, imposes comprehensive schooling on every corner uh, of this country. Uh, in, in Northern Ireland has very fine grammar schools, but they still have to put their children through GCSEs and the things which are nowadays called A-levels and send them to the places which are nowadays called universities, which is <laughs> increasingly a satirical term. <laughs> Uh, that'll be the next book, uh, part yeah, two. I can't be bothered. No, yeah. <laughs> that's, what my, that's what my students say. Uh, so you, anyway, so just following on from that, you're critical of the way that comprehensive education has turned itself into a social and political mission. Well, there always was one. No, I know, but hang on, because you, okay. you've just done the... Yeah, you have to hang on. Uh, you've just <laughs> done that thing where you said about troublemakers, uh, you were a troublemaker, you wouldn't have liked Burble Singh School. But at the same time, in some respects, some people have, have uh, explained... The Michaela schools by saying that maybe these people would be troublemakers if they didn't have the discipline in order to maybe regiment them and discipline them out of their, you know, their r radical uh, ambitions or their criminal act activities. So, not that I'm saying that. I'm just saying that actually there is a social and political mission behind even like, the most toughest of schools. So knowledge has been downgraded, replaced by these kind of challenging social inequalities, social discussions about environmentalism or EDI or wherever it might be. I just wonder whether you think. That's the case, whether you've got comments on that, on whether you think grammar schools are or would be immune to that. Um, nothing is immune to changes in society, but some changes in society are brought about by political and 
educational and legal changes. And sometimes, you, if you want to find out what happened first, uh, then you will find. I mean, for the separate subject, but I just mentioned people sometimes say to me, "Well, uh, we have uh, we have a culture now in which drugs are acceptable, so it's no use trying to change the law." And I reply, "Actually, it was the changes of the law, the watering down of the law, and the refusal of the police to enforce it, which changed the culture." And I believe that the the destruction of the grammar schools with their rigor and their discipline and their concentration on education for its own sake. And indeed, I have to say, because part of this book, a very important part of this book is about the much slandered secondary moderns, the destruction of them too and their replacement with the, the gigantic, uncontrollable and largely purposeless comprehensive uh, schools. The, the, this, this led to these things happening. Uh, there, are, there are schools now, people, almost always in this argument, people come and say, well, what about the grammar schools in Kent and the one the grammar schools in Buckinghamshire? Uh, they're, they're full of middle-class parents who've got their children in. And I say, yeah, of course they are, uh, because this is what happens if you, in, a, in, in a system like this. If, you, if, you, if there's a minority of better schools, then the better informed and, and, and more well-off parents will fight their children into them. But it does, doesn't mean that a national system of selective schools, of probably about 2,000 of them, would undergo the same problem. But it, it's not, it, this is about the past. This book is about the past uh, and about a mistake made in the past. And I, I have lots of thoughts about comprehensive education, uh, but many of them apply also to modern grammar schools. Uh, and because what we had has been lost, rigor has been lost. And part of the loss, of course, in, in many ways, is, it's the first step in the Cultural Revolution, which this country uh, uh, underwent from the middle 60s onwards at increasing pace. Once you dethrone the, the, the canons of, of knowledge, whether it be in mathematics uh, or the sciences or in English literature or in history, once you dethrone those, then anything can be taught in schools. And part of what the grammar schools did was they reinforced those canons of what a, a child coming out of school ought to know and also, it reinforced the idea that a teacher was somebody in possession of knowledge whose job it was to pass it on, uh, an idea which seems to me to have been almost entirely abolished as well. Once that had gone, then the rest of the Cultural Revolution, all the rest of the drivel, uh, could then flow into the empty space that was left, as it has. Uh, well, you mentioned building comprehensive schools. I was, the one, one thing, as an aside, which I thought was absolutely fascinating, I didn't realise, is that from 1964, I think there was 190 comprehensive schools, and then by 1974, there was 2,500 or something. Yeah, boom, yeah. Like a Chinese scale of construction. Gigantic, yeah. Do you, see, do you see that ever materialising? We can't build a railway, apparently, but do you, do you see that that, that that would be required to have that notion of not just educational standards, but actually construction in the building? Honestly, if the Cultural Revolution thought that having HS2 would help to bring down the cultural and moral level of the country and, 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 and accelerate, the, uh, accelerate the Gramsci Revolution, then HS2 would have been built by now. Uh, they can always find money for the things they want to do, particularly the destructive ones. I mean, they found a lot of money for this, for this weird body we have now called the police force, um, which I can't find any, I can't even find any evidence that exists. <laughs> Tell me, I mean, if, if, the, if the whole police force in this, this country were abducted by aliens tonight, how long would it take us to notice? <laughs> but they spend masses on that because they, they won't, they, they turn out, there will be occasions, wherever they keep them, I don't know, they turn out for a big demonstration, <laughs> and then they vanish. Uh, can I ask you? What they do not do is enforce the criminal law. <laughs> can I ask you about, uh, since we're talking about co comprehensive, and again, you talk about that kind of revolutionary moment where people that were um, you know, poor or disadvantaged actually got an opportunity to get an education. So, this, because obviously an education is a little bit more than just a sum of its parts. I mean, there's a social mixing that goes on as well. Yeah. And so when you're talking about the, the rare few grammar schools remaining, they're not ex necessarily a massive social mix. But that could be possible if there was a national scale development. I, I agree with you. But, then, but in one occasion you say, uh, in a, a criticism, you say, in the 1960s, single sex schools were abolished. Uh, in the mere belief that co-education is axiomatically good. So I wanted to know whether it's, it's whether they're axiomatically bad. I don't know. I can't make up my mind. I think that there are some children who benefit immensely from single-sex schools. I think sometimes boys benefit from them more than girls, sometimes the other way around. I think they should be available, uh, just as I think there should be colleges at Oxford and Cambridge, which are, which are, which are for, 
for women and, and, and women alone. I think it's, it's been a good thing for the education of women that they've existed, and it'd be a shame if they all disappeared. Uh, but I can't, I, I can't rely on any research on it, because I, I don't know of any that exists. Uh, I've, I've spent the, the defense budget of a minor Latin American country on trying to get my children educated over the past uh, 30, 40 years or so, and I, judging by results, a lot of it's gone down the <laughs> gurgler, but I don't, um, it's, it's not what I hoped for, but uh, no, it's, no, I don't want to disparage my children, but I, mean, it, it, I, I, don't, think, I don't think any of them had the educational chances that I had because they simply had ceased to exist. However much money you spent, you couldn't get them. Uh, and it, it, th th this has happened. Uh, how did I get there? <laughs> no, I, you anyway, are. Uh, no, so look, it, one thing you mentioned in your opening remarks was about deference and all the rest of it. You, you do say that ending of grammar schools was an ideological attack on the socially conservative, hierarchical and deferential, in a, in a way which suggests that you like those things. You think they're oh, absolutely. very, very, very important. Yes. Well, that was the framing of your own remarks. And heart what discord follows. But you do have you, to have heart. I know, but do you not think that there's something beneficial to maybe getting rid of deference, for example, in the way that maybe it used to be in 50 years ago? Well, I think if the alternative to deference is a strong state uh, with, with uh, a, a police force equipped and permanently walking around with clubs and handcuffs on them, and if the, if the alternative to deference is the, is the kind of things you often see in, in modern so-called academy schools with heavy uh, people who like bouncers hanging around in the classes to keep order, then actually I think I'd much rather have deference. Yeah, I think deference, is, like, like so many of these things that we, that we got rid of, uh, it was much preferable to the naked authority, uh, which is otherwise necessary to keep uh, society in order. So, yeah, I'm prepared to stand up here and say yes, Let's have, let's have more of it. Okay. Especially to me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to that. We'll see whether that pans out in a moment. Just final question then, really, which is that, um, finished? again, this is, well, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear the views of the audience. The, um, even, in t even though you're kind of critical of Labour's role in all this, uh, well, left to Labour is, is um, just one way of looking at it, but they're often a hypocritical attitude grammar schools, let's put it that way, yes. Um, there seems to be kind of an, I read at least, an urgency to your book that you were writing uh, that I felt that you were like writing it as a, in, an, a note to an incoming government. Again, maybe I'm, if this is a terrible question, it's embarrassing, but that's how I felt that you were writing it. You say, if a return to selection is to come about, it will have to come from the left. Uh, and I felt, you know, there we, at the time I was reading it, I was anticipating Starmer waltzing into government in a very short order, and I felt you were appealing to the Labour government to maybe pick up on some of your ideas. No, not really. I just think that anybody who wants to influence events in this country has to influence the left because they are now wholly in charge. And for instance, they're wholly in charge of the Conservative Party, so there wouldn't be much point <laughs> trying to influence them. On that bombshell. Uh, <laughs> We'll have a rousing round of applause to Peter. <laughs> Anybody that introduced an American-style whistling will have to leave. <laughs> uh, right, but we have, uh, we're, we're going to stand here naked in front of the chamber, it, it, metaphorically speaking, uh, for any, any questions. Now, Peter has asked me whether I'll do one at a time. Obviously, I'm going to ignore him. Uh, as a radical, you know, abuser of, uh, of deference. Uh, and we'll take a couple, if that's all right. It's so, bl it's so Blairite. Uh, <laughs> no, I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you what it is. by Alistair Campbell with one purpose. No, no, we were doing it long before that, that Alistair Campbell. Couldn't, that you and the thing couldn't, is, that, that, that <laughs> most, you could choose which of the questions to answer and you could not answer the ones you didn't want to answer. No, Very no, useful. No, no, no. Very useful no, for the Blair creature who couldn't a, answer anyway. What a cynic. No, the, the idea is, is that there may be similar questions that you could group into a much more efficient response. <laughs> so, like a sort of comprehensive yeah, question. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. It's a multiple choice. Uh, right, uh, the microphone is floating around the back. Okay, we'll come from the back. There's a gentleman right at the very back with his hand up. I'll, I'll move forward, don't worry. Comments or questions, it doesn't matter. Thank you, Peter Hitchens. Very interesting talk. Uh, do you think we should encourage and make it easier for more homeschooling in education? 
Yes, I do. See, yeah, he does. <laughs> yes, I, yes, I absolutely do. It's, well, you, you, See, you, didn't, you ignore me. I'm ignoring you. Um, <laughs> It's, I, though I, I'm very worried that what's happened since, particularly since the, the great shutdown, is that the, a lot of activity is now called homeschooling, which isn't really homeschooling. Homeschooling is a tremendous thing. In the United States, it's become a, a, an enormous movement and has been hugely successful. It, it gets very large numbers of children into the IVD colleges uh, because it's, it's so superb in quality. And the, the, the lone parents don't have to operate entirely on their own because of the level of organization, the shared, uh, the shared books and the, sh the, sh the shared curriculums which they follow have been tremendous. In this country, it's, it hasn't reached that stage yet, but I think for many parents who are worried uh, both about the poor quality and about the propagandist nature of, of state and increasingly of, of fee charging education as well, it may be the option, but I have to tell you, it is knowing quite well as I do one person who is engaged in a lot of homeschooling, it is very difficult and very hard work. And of course, it's, it's extremely difficult in a world where, where the, the, the economy and, uh, and society and custom and tradition increasingly force uh, both parents to go out to work. But yes, I am very much in favor, of, and I defend it. I was very alarmed by the bad man report and the, 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 the rather worrying suggestion in it, which seems to suggest that a, a, the government might want to get rid of it in the way that uh, the government in Germany has actually, well, actually it was Hitler who made it illegal, but the shocking thing is that, that, that more than half a century of democratic government in Germany hasn't restored the freedom to do it. It is a vital freedom, and I, I defend it. Okay. So like I say, <laughs> because he's going to run away with this uh, conversation, uh, you can pause it, you can make comments and observations as well as just asking questions, otherwise it just becomes a Q&A swift response. And Peter needs to learn. Uh, <laughs> from, from you, the public voice. Uh, the gentleman, uh, the white hair, hand up his finger in the air. Thank you, Mr. Hitchens, for that uh, introduction. Since socialism has always loathed the middle classes, and yet the irony is that so many socialists are middle class, um, is Starmer's intention to put VAT on private schools uh, ideological or fiscal? I think it's I think it's ideological. Uh, I think it's it, basically it's it's the operation of spite in politics. He doesn't care particularly uh, what happens uh, to the parents who are on the uh, look. What, what's happened in private education over the past twenty or thirty years is that it's become more and more out of reach of most people, and the the the, the middle class families who used to be able to afford it at a stretch now can't even do that. The effect on the real rich, the people Labour professes to hate, will be considerable. It's not, it's not a policy adopted because of any, it, it, it probably won't even be particularly successful fiscally because schools will close, but the, it, it's not a policy adopted because of any good that it may do. It's a policy ad adopted to please the mob, and it has no other purpose. Some people might be getting something uh, that you can't get, so we will stop them getting it. But it's not, in any case, to me, it's the whole thing about private education is it is so much not the answer. One of the things about the, 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 great, the, the great 20 years of grammar schools was that they pushed the private schools out of the way. Uh, in particularly, it, it was notable, the, the Franks report to, to the state of Oxford University in the early 60s showed that grammar schools and direct grant schools were pushing the private fee charging schools out of Oxford entrance and the, the huge numbers of children from places who would never previously have got to Oxbridge were getting in because of it. And the, the private schools were kept honest by the grammar schools. Now we have the examination system we have, uh, which is, is so hopelessly diluted. Almost any school with anything remotely resembling discipline and anything remotely resembling cooperation between parents and teachers can achieve astonishingly high results in GCSEs and A-levels, which don't actually indicate a good school. And so I'm not, I don't want this to be, I don't, I don't want anyone to come away from this thinking that I'm motivated here by a, a, a desire to defend private education. In, in what is in some ways my favorite European country, the, the Federal Republic of Germany, private education is the resort of the dunce uh, because it's still possible within the state system to get a first rate secondary education through selection. And really, that would be much more the, 
my, my ideal. So it's, it, 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 it's I, I don't want to find myself pushed here into a defense of private education. I'd rather there wasn't any, actually. All right, thanks. I think I should take this gentleman, otherwise you're going to get thrombosis in his arm. <laughs> yeah. Um, stand up. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm a... Uh, former law enforcement intelligence analyst, the old customs and excise when we still had responsibility for drug trafficking. I've uh, come out of the studios, TV studios, and you've been walking straight in. I very much hope you will be able to continue and expand your comments on the drug situation to take into account what institutionalized law enforcement is largely ignoring, which is the arrival of malign nation states in drug trafficking. My question on education is, as a Scot, you made a devastatingly accurate comment about how all this happened so much faster in Scotland. Are you planning to go north of the border to talk about this because there's an awful lot of very angry people need to hear what you're saying. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of you to ask. Um, I would go like a shot to talk about this in Scotland, but I can only go where I'm invited. Uh, there's not much point in my, in, 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 in my standing at the top of the Royal Mile. Uh, I, mean, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't do this. I can do. I used to do the street meetings, but I, 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 I most recently did one in Liverpool. But you, it, in general, you need to be invited. And I took a lot of trouble in the writing of this book because it was very hard to find out, to discover what had actually happened in Scotland and, and what the system had been like, which was so rapidly destroyed. But instead of Circular 1065, which which allowed local authorities to, to, to put the brakes on the, the closure of grammar schools in England and Wales, uh, the Scottish Circular just ordered uh, the, the closure. And of course, the, the, the Scottish equivalents of the, of the direct grant schools uh, very quickly were, were made inoperable because the, there wasn't any more a qualifying examination for children to go to them. And what had been one of the best education systems in Europe was in a very, very short time wiped out, which I think may be one of the reasons why I think at one stage, the city of Edinburgh had 25% of its children attending private schools. It was that bad. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is a huge scale. I, it, it's, I haven't been asked, and I, I, I would very, very happily be asked. Are there any Scots in the room with a venue? Uh, we'll speak to you afterwards. Uh, right, lots of hands. Take the lady just next to you, if that's all right. Keep your life easy, and then we'll move further back. I appreciate your book was about the past. What do we do now? I, that's up to you. I should be dead soon. <laughs> You will be if you keep on interrupting. Oh, anyway, right. So you, you can now group Post these two. <laughs> so the gentleman there with his hand, the tallest man, look at the back there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, P Peter, is it possible to square the circle um, in relation to uh, selective education by having streaming within a comprehensive system? So in other words, you've got the, the, the bright kids, the scholarship kids, in a sense, being hothoused and, and being able to excel within a comprehensive system. I don't quite understand why these people need to be educated in separate institutions themselves. The evidence suggests not. Uh, I did visit a school which did this down on the borders of, of uh, Kent and, and, and London a few years ago. And they had been quite successful in setting up a sort of semi-selective school within the comprehensive but the results were nothing like as good as those achieved, even, even in, in modern times, by the, the things which are now, nowadays called grammar schools, which, which in my view are not. Uh, I think there is something about uh, the institutional force of a school. And remember, the other key thing about this is that the grammar school can, can be small and still maintain a serious sixth form, as we used to call it, for, for, for university entrance and A-level preparation. A comprehensive has to be huge to sustain anything like a big sixth form, or indeed to teach many of the subjects which have rapidly fallen out, and particularly languages, tragically, fallen out of teaching in many, in, in many state comprehensives. I think that this, I mean, my, my wife went to a grammar school, and the institutional force and tradition of the, that, that school, which was in South London, and had, had existed for hundreds of years, had enormous effects on the girls who went to it, and, and made it able to demand more of them. 
uh, than just being in a stream of a much larger school was. I also happen to think that very big schools are by their nature bad. I think it's almost impossible for anyone to control them. I think a, head, a, a, a headmaster, head teacher, whatever term you want to use, and his staff should not have as their primary purpose policing and social work. They should be engaged in teaching. But if the school is too big, then you can't do that. Thanks very much. Uh, right, again, I, I appeal, no, do I appeal? Do I appeal to you? Uh, no, I, I appeal to you uh, to maybe make some comments and questions. Uh, have a go at Peter. We don't want to love in here. Uh, you know, don't, don't let him go. He's just defended deference, for God's sake. Right. Uh, Someone the, has we, to. We, <laughs> we take the gentleman at the very back there, standing up, yeah, and, then, and then move it along to the next guy. Thank you. Um, my name is Tom. I've got a son who's 12 in a uh, comprehensive in South London. And um, just, to, sorry, it's loud, this, um, just to follow on from what you were saying about policing, I was really surprised, actually, at the discipline. It's a massive school in Forest Hill. It's Forest Hill Boys, actually, so it's an all-boys school. And the level of discipline is astonishing. My, my son didn't know, didn't know what hit him coming from primary school. He'd been busy doing handprints with paint for six years and then comes into this school... <laughs> And they're being told, if, if they're late for the lesson, they get a five-minute detention. If they don't bring a black pen, blue pen, green pen, red pen, yellow pen, they get a five-minute detention. They're sent to referral for having done that twice. You get the picture. I it's do. very, very strict. And my comment on it, I suppose, is that on one hand, I think it's, I'm a troublemaker. I wouldn't have lasted there five minutes, I don't think. But then I'm middle class. I had two parents, there's lots of kids there with single parent families. Not to say that that's necessarily going to result in bad behaviour, but children who are living in very pressurised domestic situations and probably haven't encountered discipline at all. And here they are at school, engaging with it, realising that there are boundaries, and I think it's probably doing them quite a lot of good. But it's, and it's, like I say, I can't impress upon you how strict they are about it. It's non-negotiable. If you haven't got a black pen, five-minute detention. Yeah, I think this may be the influence of Catherine Burwell Singh, which is actually quite wide now, I find, as you hear about quite a lot of schools trying to do what she's done at Michaela. Uh, and it, it's better than the alternative. The other thing about this, there are two points I'd like to make. One is that there are, in our education system, many extremely talented people uh, working in as, as, as hard as they can to make the best of it. The problem is that the system makes it harder for them to do it. If you're, if you're, if you're a really good head, then if, you've, if you're given charge of a big comprehensive school, you can, by sheer force of personality and by experience and by, and, and by skill, you can achieve levels of discipline and order uh, which are impressive. And such schools do exist. Part of the problem is when that charismatic head leaves, uh, then it, it fades away again because the system is working to undermine it all the time. But the other thing which cannot be ignored in any discussion of this kind is that during the period that I'm discussing, uh, the, the, the abolition of, of state selective schools from 1965 onwards was also a period of huge social revolution, which I think was accelerated by the destruction of those schools, in which, amongst other things, uh, the, the, the married family was largely dismantled, Huge numbers of boys have, have had to grow up without fathers, which is the absolute beginning of <coughs> discipline and good behavior in their lives. And at the same time, we have a chaotic uh, culture in so many ways, and one in, in which also all kinds of very bad behaviors, such as the taking of drugs, begin as early as perhaps 11 and sometimes even younger. So the, the crisis which the new schools face is colossal, and it's not entirely down to grammar schools. In a way, every book that I've written since what, uh, 1999, when I, I wrote The Abolition of Britain, has actually been a, an attempt to fill in the gaps which were left in that initial book. That it is, it is, this country has been the victim of a cultural revolution as devastating as that which overtook China under Mao Zedong, uh, but not even slightly reversed and tolerated because it was done with stealth and subtlety so that people didn't in many cases, even realized it was going on. So uh, schools by themselves, policing by itself, uh, the restoration of the privileges of marriage by itself, none of these things by themselves are the, the prosecution of, of, of drug offenses, the 
uh, the reform of the criminal justice system, the prisons, all these things, none of them by themselves uh, would resolve these problems. We have a huge array of problems feeding into the national crisis which we face. And now the worst of them is we have a bankrupt state, which is actually borrowing money to pay the interest on its debt. So, I, but it, these things can none of them be viewed independently, and they're not all these books are supplements to and to be read alongside the abolition of Britain, which is the original, uh, the original book which I wrote, which has been ignored by everybody ever since. So, uh, we haven't got that one on sale, unfortunately, but it's in all good bookshops. Uh, it so isn't. Uh, it still isn't. You can't find it. All good bookshops. No, no, it isn't. It absolutely isn't. I've got my copy one. Uh, the gentleman there with the spectacles at the very back, next to where you, you were before, okay? Uh, and then I've got two, I'll just take two upstairs. So we'll take this gentleman first. You have to bellow. How many hands have I got upstairs? Three. Oh, God. So I'll take three hands, right? Can they all shout and we'll take them as, as a bulk? Because <laughs> otherwise, I might, have to I might have to translate. Oh, it doesn't matter. So you're go on, go on. being charged rent or something. I can't, we can't do it. <laughs> Council tax. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hitchens. I'm a big admirer of your work. I was fortunate enough to um, go to a grammar school in Belfast, where I'm from. And um, in Northern Ireland, grammar schools were largely seen as um, healing sectarian divisions that existed, most of them being non denominational and also class divisions. Um, and I'm curious about what do you th to what extent do you think that uh, grammar schools were abolished in order to um, exacerbate class divisions and capitalise upon. Uh, or capitalise upon that. Do you want me to work on his accent? I can translate for you. <laughs> anyway, no, sorry, carry on. And I'll check you gentlemen up there. Yeah, look, um, the, 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 the chief ideological proponent of, of what, what he called common schools, Brian Simon, uh, was a, an actual active member of the Communist Party, as were several of the other people prominent in the movement for comprehensive education. And he believed uh, that it would lead to a more equal society. He, he, he misled himself on that basis. So no, I don't think so. Uh, I think that they, they didn't think through what they were doing. Oddly enough, had they had more power, uh, had they had the power to decide where people lived uh, and, uh, and how much they earned, which of course is the, is the power which the state possesses in a communist society, they could have made a better go of it uh, than they did. But fortunately for us, they didn't have that power, so they were only able to smash up part of civil society in the pursuit of their objectives. By the way, I disagree with you about Northern Ireland Grammar Schools and, uh, and sectarianism. It seems to me principally that Northern Ireland Grammar Schools, are, although I know that the people from different communities from, from go, go, to, go to, to effectively Protestant grammar schools, I, kn I know that they don't bar Roman Catholic pupils, nor the other way around. They are divided. In fact, the last time I looked, uh, the Roman Catholic and the Protestant grammar schools had separate uh, systems of entrance examination. So that isn't entirely true. Uh, I, I don't think they exist to, in, to, to, to enforce or, or perpetuate the division in Northern Ireland. I think to some extent they reflect its continued existence, but I think it would be wrong to say that they were, they were non-sectarian. Have you ever thought of that? I too recoil from the hypocrisy with which the middle class, upper middle class, have presided over um, uh, the destruction of education. I remember my richest relatives making a big show of how they weren't going to send their kids to public school. They would go to the local comprehensive. The local comprehensive was Holland Park. Yes. So they were in a classroom with everybody else called Tancred and Cyrus. And, <laughs> um, and I, I share your righteous anger about the dilution of knowledge, uh, rendering it banal. Um, uh, uh, but my experience of... Um, of, of being at a direct grant uh, school many decades ago is that the embodiment of, of transcendent knowledge looked a lot like the man in the portrait whose, whose caption I, I'm too far away to read. And I put it to you that people like that knew they were preaching to the choir and they were safe in the knowledge that the rest of the congregation had been excluded. And so they were uh, projecting the transcendent uh, quality of uh, academic knowledge to an inner circle. Uh, and, did, and they did it all the more comfortably uh, because the rest of the population were not 
going to have access to that. Now, I'm not saying that every child has the same cognitive capacity at age 11, 12, or whatever. But I am saying that every child should, have, uh, should be introduced to that sliding scale of where rigorous academic knowledge can take us. And that kind of personification uh, that was embodied in the grammar school didn't give it to them, was designed not to give it to them. And I think really you're attaching a lot of things that have gone so terribly wrong uh, with education since um, to, to grammar schools, which really didn't have the inter institutional capacity to deliver what you and I in many ways uh, both seem to want. Well, I concede uh, that a number of the things which have gone wrong with schooling since 1965 are not directly caused by the abolition of grammar schools, though I think they were made easier by it. But I, I'm slightly baffled by the point you're making. It's even the Sutton Trust, which is no friend of mine, concedes that the the, the modern uh, elite comprehensives, the ones that are supposedly best state schools in the country, are hugely socially selective. And what you say about grammar schools is, is actually uh, the case in the, the, the best comprehensive schools. In fact, when you're arguing with the, the labor elite about, uh, about this issue, if they will argue, they, mostly they won't come now when I try and challenge them for debate. Uh, the one point they will not address is the, is the catchment area business, which so many new Labour people have used, whether you buy an immensely expensive house in the catchment area of a, of a, of a better uh, state comprehensive school and, and obtain selection of some kind of that in, in, in that case. This is very common among the elite, and it, it, it exists. Whereas, in 1954, the Gurney-Dixon report, and you can all look this up on your phones if you want to, because it's, it's, it's on the internet, uh, and check my figures, which may not be totally accurate. Uh, to win, but to, within one or two percentage points, I will tell you that in Table J of the Gurney-Dixon report, uh, it's established that 63% of pupils at grammar schools in that year came from working class backgrounds. No even remotely good state secondary school open anywhere in these islands today can make that claim now. It simply isn't possible. Nothing, I'm not a utopian. I, I'm an ameliorator. I'm, in most of my instincts are social democratic. I don't think that you can get a perfect school system, and I, I, I would mistrust anybody who offered one, but one which provided uh, a, a school system in which the, the, the working classes of this country were properly represented in the best secondary schools, as, that, as was the case uh, at, at that time, seems to me to be something to be very, very pleased about. Now, my book explains a crucial thing about this, and I'm going to say this now because I may not get another opportunity that one of the things which destroyed the grammar schools was the complete failure of the Conservative Party during this period to build the ones which were plainly needed. I am a product of something which in this country we used to call the baby bulge. It's now been Americanized to the baby boom. Everybody knew that in the year 1956, the baby bulge, which had gone through the state primary schools of the country, causing enormous stress because the, the huge numbers of extra children needed to be accommodated, everybody knew that in 1956 it would hit the secondary schools. The Conservative government at the time made no effort whatsoever to build new grammar schools to, to provide for this increase, none. And so when the wave broke over the secondary state education system in 1956, they were overwhelmed. And this led uh, pretty much directly to the crisis, which many of you will have heard of, where the middle classes started to say, well, maybe we don't like the 11 plus after all because our children are failing it. Because they were failing it because there were fewer places and the selection became much, much tighter. This is a disaster. The other thing I will say, because I, I wanted to go on about it and the opportunity hasn't arisen, is I, I make huge use in the book of a, of a really superb book by a man called Dick Stroud called The Secondary Mod. Dick Stroud attended a secondary modern school uh, and ended up getting a very good science degree at a good university from such a school and became very annoyed by the way in which left-wing politicians kept saying that those children who went to secondary modern schools were, secondary, were second class citizens or or, or thrown on the scrap heap. He didn't think he'd been thrown on the scrap heap. And he establishes in the book, it seems to me quite strongly, that the secondary modern schools, which were also destroyed in the Comprehensive Revolution, were in many cases extremely good for those who went to them. And if they hadn't been hamstrung in their first years by the Labour government's refusal to let their pupils take proper exams, 
uh, that would be more evident. They later were allowed to take those exams and did very well, and quite a surprising number of secondary modern school children actually got to university, often by cunning arrangements, but they did do so, and certainly got, uh, got good A-levels as well as good O-levels at the time. There's a very fascinating scandal about the exam results of secondary models compared with comprehensives, which is detailed in the book, which I commend you to read because it is so interesting. So, no, I don't agree with you about that. I, in, if you go to the German-speaking countries in Europe, you will often find people like plumbers and electricians who are actually highly culturally educated, and they, they've, they've been educated to live a civilized and full uh, life in a way which doesn't happen here among the working class uh, because of the excellent schools there. And which are selective on the lines which, which I believe in. You can't have perfection, but my goodness, you could do so much better than we do in the Britain of 2023. Uh, can we, I, I'll have to come down the front now. I, move, I work my way back. We have, to, we have time. Uh, can I take this gentleman here with the spectacles? Thank you. Um, Mr. Good afternoon, Mr. Hitchens. Uh, my name's Chris Williams. Um, a very sizable possibly a minority, but a very sizable minority of people in this country would agree with everything you're saying. It's not just your Daily Mail readers, as I'm sure you appreciate. Um, so how do we get these ideas that you're talking about today and have been talking about for many years put into effect in the current political system? Maybe Scotland would be the way to get it going. I don't think you can. I think, I think that the, uh, unt unless and until someone can devise a way of, de of defeating and reversing uh, the cultural, moral, sexual, and social revolution of the past 60 years, it can't be done because it doesn't have and could not have the support uh, that would be necessary to make it happen. I have to leave it to those who come after me. I do not think, I mean, I, I have my share of, of, of uh, guilt and blame in some of the things that have been done to this country, which I acknowledge. Uh, when I was too stupid and too, uh, and too arrogant, and you may think I'm stupid and arrogant now, but you should have seen me when I was 22. <laughs> uh, it, the, I, I have some responsibility for this, which I, and for other things which I greatly regret, but I think somehow or other, either those who wish to see this country uh, recover uh, have to begin now their own reverse long march through the institutions, or it's lost. Uh, I don't think it's, it, it will be within the power of, of, of my generation and what's left of it uh, to do much about it. These things take a very, very long time. But I commend to you one thing uh, in that, which is that if you, if you, if you have to really mean it. Uh, it's always been noticeable in this country that the Conservative Party doesn't really mind losing elections. Some of you will remember when John Major lost the, one of the most significant elections in, in modern history in 1997. What did he do? He went off to watch the cricket. <laughs> where five years before, Neil Kinnock had, had lost an election, and he went and stood at a, at a meeting in a state of obvious, total fury, disappointment, close to tears, making a, a speech of enormous eloquence and resentment that he lost. And until the, what you might call the, the, conser the socially conservative, which is by no means necessarily of the right, until the socially conservative forces in this country have that amount of passion for their cause, then they can't expect to win any battles at all. You mentioned the politics of spite, and um, I hope this doesn't sound conspiratorial. Um, but I wondered whether there was more than it, it was more than just incidental that the grammar schools turned out to be the targets uh, of these people um, because they couldn't get to the the private schools, because it strikes me that the thing that, that the grammar schools do is expose that if you select by ability, a lot of rich people are going to lose out because they're not necessarily that bright, um, whereas grammar schools are a unique force in some ways for social mobility. And so I just wondered whether, whether you had any thought on, on the idea that actually it wasn't an egalitarian impulse or at least not just an egalitarian impulse, but actually something like a, a protection and safeguarding of privilege from the top. It's, a, it's an appealing theory, but I don't think the facts support it. Uh, two of the most prominent uh, Labour politicians involved in the structure of economic schools were Anthony Crossland, who I think attended uh, UCS, uh, a very, um, a, a very uh, distinguished private school, and of course 
uh, Shirley Williams, who was educated, I think, at St. Paul's in London and privately also in the United States. Uh, both of them are considerable intellects uh, and people who would be a success in any society. And no, I think the problem with them was that the, the very often in, in intelligent people do stupid things. And one of the main reasons why intelligent people do stupid things is because they've become the, the slaves of utopianism. And if you want the reason for that, then I would say it lay very, very largely in the, the collapse of the Christian religion in our society. And so the, the appeal of utopianism to, to, uh, to people who have no religion is strong. Uh, utopians are always doing stupid things, particularly at the moment. One of their favorite activities is starting wars. Uh, you'll notice it. So no, I don't think, I don't, I don't think it works. Uh, and also, one, I'd say one other thing. One of the most the fiercest defenders of grammar schools was the, the County Durham Labour Party, which had made a huge effort in the years between the war to create grammar schools for the sons and daughters of minors in the belief that they should have the best education that they could possibly get. And they were totally committed to it. There were large parts of the Labour Party, that part, the working class part, and also the Fabian part, particularly R.H. Tawney, who were passionately committed uh, to continue with ground schools and were overborne by, uh, by other forces in the Labour Party. Thanks very much. Uh, right, we have a lady at the front, well, two people at the front. I can't take together because people will not allow. Uh, no, I'm glad I've got you where I want you to. <laughs> Hello, uh, Mr Hitchens. Thanks for all of that, um, for sharing that with us. Really interesting. I'm a former teacher, and uh, it was the mid-80s when um, I was doing a PGCE, and I want to say something about the people that teach the teachers, the education establishment. The, uh, the, the academics in the department, the Department of Education, were absolutely cock-a-hoot with ecstasy about the overhaul of the exam system, and uh, the evil O-level was about to get put in the bin of history and we were now going to have something called the GCSE which was going to be fantastic there's a brave new dawn of something that no one was going to fail as you're going to have grades from A down to G and uh, I've got a few of us who I don't know, we've probably got our cards marked straight away we're, we're thinking what in the name of God is the point of an exam that nobody could fail mm -hmm. before long only A to C will mean anything and, and, and that's what happened pretty quickly. And then we thought, well, you're going to get grade inflation before long. You know, a GCSE is only going to be really what, um, or A-levels are going to be what GCSE was like. It's just going to be nonsense, a total con. And, and I just want to share with you as well, their sort of fury about and loathing of grammar schools was absolutely unbridled in that education department. And, um, yeah, you know, Kent and Buckinghamshire... I mean, they, they could be spitting with contempt when they talked about schools there. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Also, my, my experience of being in schools, uh, teachers, a lot of the, most of my colleagues were on the left, absolutely hated the grammar school system, were really critical of it, but did everything they could to make sure their kids got in. <laughs> and just a couple of things to share. Well, I, I don't think I need to comment on that. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to take the next gentleman? It works. Thank you for talking to us, Mr. Hitchers. Uh, you've effectively done a retrospective, a post-mortem, if you like, of the British education system, uh, as I say, I, at least it appears to me. I haven't read your book yet, I'm afraid. Uh, you've also spoken, from what I gathered, rather highly of the German uh, education system, uh, the present day one to some extent, perhaps the past and more. Um, I, I'll keep my question fairly direct. Do you, for those looking to the future to rebuild something, you know, sort of <laughs> leaving aside the whole reversal of the Cultural Revolution, do you think we should be looking, apart from the past British grammar school system and perhaps the German system, to any other countries in general? I don't know what your awareness is, but uh, what's your advice? I, Focus on the British and try and revive that, or what else? Look, I stress the German system because it's, it's, people aren't aware of the, of the fact that, that a, a large, prosperous, and successful country in, in continental Europe still has some selection viability. So I, I, st I stress it for that reason. It isn't perfect. I also stress it because it's not necessary uh, for anybody who supports selection by ability to support necessarily the, the age at which we select in, 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 in this country, which is, it seems to me possibly to be too early. Uh, and it, it's not necessary to support the, the method of the 11 plus test, uh, which is not used in Germany. They, they tend to, to select people by assessment rather than by a test. And it seems to work quite successfully. I also make the point, because it's fascinating to me, uh, that communist East Germany, uh, which had quite good education up to a certain level, 
uh, was comprehensive, except that it had special advice uh, to overture extended upper schools uh, for an elite of the elite who tended to be the children of, of senior members of the Communist Party, not exclusively. And then when that came to an end, when the Communist East Germany collapsed, one of the first things that happened was when East Germany was broken up into states, into Lendem, that parents went to their new local authorities and petitioned them for the reopening of gymnasium grammar schools, uh, which had been abolished under communism. And this was very successfully done. And I've been to, in the lovely Baltic town of Bismarck, to one such school uh, where the children of dockers and doctors shared the same class. Uh, it was very moving to see. So it can be done, but I think the problem with Germany is, that particularly the people who lived under the, the GDR's communist rule, is that those who understand what communism is about and who understand what the left can do and how dangerous it is uh, will have the passion and the, uh, and the vigor uh, when they get the opportunity to challenge it in this way. But people in this country who've never had that experience and don't know, uh, possibly don't realize how important it is or that it's possible to challenge it. Uh, there's many things wrong with German education. Uh, in some parts of the country, it has gone comprehensive. And in some parts of the country, the, 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 the grammar schools are not as good as they are in others. But people aren't aware of just how much difference there is between education in different countries in Europe, and nor are they aware of just how much the, the British comprehensive system was directly modeled by Graham Savage in a paper he wrote for the Board of Education in the late 20s on the American high school system in a report in which he said that it would be more democratic, but it would lead to a decline in educational quality. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Hitchens. Um, well, first of all, just basing actually just what you concluded on there about not knowing about what's going on in other countries. Uh, I'm Scottish. Uh, my mother was a teacher. I went to a state school. But if I'm honest, I am completely ignorant of grammar schools and what they were. And this is really honestly my first time understanding them. And, and so I will actually pick up your book because it's something I'm completely ignorant about, if I'm honest. So this is really more of a, just a statement of just uh, what you said earlier about the cultural revolution as well, of how total it's blanked, been blanked out. They, yes, they it's, told it's, there's it, it, the 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 this the knowledge of this. It, I can't believe I didn't really know anything about this. If I'm, it's, an, uh, it's an embarrassing thing to admit, but it's true. Don't be embarrassed. This is my favourite scene in, in George Orwell's 1984 is the scene where Winston Smith goes into the pub mm. and tries to have a conversation about the past with an old man, mm. and at the end of it, he concludes that the the claims of the Communist Party of whatever or whatever the party was that was ruling Airstrip one, the claims of the party of, about, what it, about what it had done and the claims of the party about what the past had been like could no longer be challenged because nobody anymore knew what it had been like before. Absolutely. This is increasingly the position. By the way, the, the term grammar school was not widely used in Scotland. The, the, it, it, it's much more complicated than that. But I do, because I did the work, I, to understand what, how it worked and, and what the schools were called and, and what people went to, to and how, and, and how it was shut down, and the effects of it on Scottish universities, which also used to be excellent and now are not, <laughs> uh, is, is quite, I, I decided that I was determined to get it down precisely because it was so difficult to get the information. And, and luckily I chanced upon an academic at the uh, University of Edinburgh who was able to steer me in the right direction because it is, it's in ordinarily, openly published stuff, incredibly hard to find out. Yeah, well, it's, buried, it's a buried piece of national history. So thank you for doing I'll that. I'll be That's glad brilliant. to, and, to uh, provide it to you. Um, yeah, and yeah, so thank you, and hope you can come to Scotland soon. Every time I can. <laughs> what is this about Scotland? Uh, anyway, uh, I'm it's, sure it's, it's lovely up there. Um, right, good. That was a very nice lecturally way of talking to a student, by the way, uh, if there are any lecturers in the room, rather than showing contempt. The gentleman at the end. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Hitchens. Um, I became a history teacher in about the mid-90s. I'm teaching history at a sixth-form college. I started off as a supply teacher, so I taught around London quite a lot. Um, but the history curriculum at the time was uh, a choice of two, the rise of the Nazis or the Russian Revolution. And that's what was available. Uh, I, I taught them ad nauseum. Uh, but... Um, the reason for that being the curriculum, I think, was because the British left 
in its failure to realize its socialist revolution, which would have been brought about by the Labour Party taking control of the state and implementing all the socialist policies, its failure meant that the British left decamped into education as an alternative to that. And in the Institute of Education and many other of the teacher training colleges that they got into, they implemented policies that, uh, in a sense, tried to, I would argue, socially engineer the working class into understanding racism and understanding revolution, the Bolshevik revolution and so on. And there was an idea that you could inculcate people with something of that and hold together the possibility of some kind of socialist future out of it. But um, the irony of it is that at the same time as this was happening, um, another factor became really important, and that was anti-Semitism. Uh, if, if anybody does an academic study of what happened after the end of the Second World War, for about 20 years, 25 years, there was absolutely no interest in what had happened in the Holocaust with the anti-Semitism. And then all of a sudden, in the mid-1960s, late 60s, 70s, there became a great concentration on studying the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. And the education and what happened in it reflected the fact that people felt that, you know, the, the 11 plus and so on, and having to pass it was a, ba a way of racially demarcating people as some, some superior, some inferior. And that very much influenced what happened in, I think, the abolishment of what you're talking about, selective education. But the irony of it is that those people who, if you like, are created the new, the new teacher training facilities and the ideology that underpinned it are the ones who are responsible. They were the left, and they still are the left, and they're responsible for what's happening in education today. And the influence of, say, from America, Howard Gardner and his idea of multiple intelligences that not only can you, much you teach rationality, much you must teach ironic intelligence or romantic intelligence or an emotional intelligence. And it is these factors that now lead us to having a situation in education where young people are being taught, you know, what we consider to be wokeism. I won't go into a long diatribe about what that is. You, most of you know what it is and what's happening in education, even in, in, in nursery education or in you know, primary school education. And so the left and what it has done to British society, uh, when you think about the irony of anti-Semitism influencing them into sort of changing and abolishing a system of education, today their anti-Semitism is most evident in their reaction to what has just happened in Israel. It's a terrible tragic twist and irony. Thank you very much. A statement? But you I think it was a statement. I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, the gentleman at the very back with his hand up. Can I just, before you start, can I just see any remaining hands? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> right. uh, that's what happens when you take them one by one, that? isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, sir. I'll, I'll... Uh, just first, um, the reason people want to talk about Scotland is because <laughs> a wonderful country. That's why I live in Madrid. Um, <laughs> um, in Scotland, teacher training... In Scotland, um, you're compelled to buy only one book, and it's a huge part of the um, training exercise, and the book's called uh, Teaching Social Justice. Um, Peter, you have kind of mentioned a bit um, the destruction of education, and I'm uh, kind of interested in particular about Scotland, but, um, you know, you mentioned for the 60s, um, there's been a kind of sustained... Um, attack on education, uh, which I would kind of agree with. But I wonder, it, 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 it's, it's not been like a continual wave, and I'm wondering if there's moments you might identify when the pace was picked up um, and, um, and rethinking education or destroying it. Well, there, there, it does come and go, and there were, but I, I think I would have to refer you to the book for the particular moments at which of which the comprehensive movement, there was a time, for instance, when it was it, it, it became very frustrated that it hadn't totally triumphed in a time when it was trying very hard to introduce mixed ability teaching uh, and a time when it went into retreat towards setting uh, and all kinds of things like that. But it is one of the things about the book is it contains a, a, a quite a detailed chronology of these events and of, of their origins. But 
the, the fundamental thing that it, it, it kept coming back to me is that what, what Brian Simon was talking about, what he fully understood, is that the development of educational policy for, for a country is development of social policy. And I'm not surprised by the title of the book you mentioned, uh, because the, the, the social policy of those who devise this education position is egalitarian, and now, as I say, increasingly culturally revolutionary as well. And it, the, if anybody was trying to explain to somebody what Antonio Gramsci had meant uh, by achieving hegemony, uh, then a very good way of demonstrating what he meant <coughs> in practice would be to look at what the left have achieved in education in these islands. Very good, thank you. So final round here. Lady here at the front, black hair, gentleman with <coughs> spectacles. Thank you, Mr. Hitchens, very interesting. Um, I agree with you on the broad march through the institutions. Just maybe one observational counterpoint. Uh, my father was born in the 50s in the Soviet Union and grew up in the 60s and 70s before he left. And he had a much better education than I did, uh, which perhaps goes to show that how terrible it's become in England, actually, compared well, to even it, the Soviet Union. The, the Soviet education was quite rigorous. It wasn't achieved by, by selection, but it was achieved by, uh, by back squatting. If you failed the year, you just had to do the year again, which had, in many ways, the same effect as you moved higher up the school. Uh, it was more and more selective. Uh, also, once societies have had revolutions, then they absolutely object to anyone trying to mess around with their education system in a revolutionary fashion. So if, if this country had ever fully had the left-wing revolution, which, which people had wanted it to have in 1945, then probably we would have better schools. But because there's a continued struggle, we've, we've continued to have an adversarial parliament and free speech and a, a free press and people arguing about things, and it's never been fully settled, it remains, uh, it, it remains contentious and it remains, it remains part of the revolution rather than part of the outcome of the revolution. So I'm not particularly surprised by that. One of the other interesting effects of this has been the large numbers of Eastern European uh, migrants coming to this country who've been better educated in the skills of life uh, than, than their co-evils in this country. And I, I talked to quite a lot of, when this began to happen, particularly with Poles, quite a lot of employers about what was happening. They said, well, of course we hire these people. They want to work. Uh, they've been well educated in, in, in the basics. And they've also been given the, the, the skills for work which no pupils from English state schools are, are getting. And, and it, it, these were, this was a, a communist education system had provided better schooling. But that's because the issue was settled. As long as the revolution is still taking place, uh, then it won't be settled and the schools will be bad, except the schools which are attended by the elite. Thanks. We've got you, sir, and one more in the back. I think that's it. Mm. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Hitchens. I think my question probably follows on from that one a little bit. Um, were the, um, the, the selective technical schools, the, the third part of the 1944 Education Act, were they a success in that 20 years? And if not, was it because they weren't built or was it because they were a bit of an educational dead end? I have never seen any study of them. I know only that there were very few. Uh, there was one in my hometown of Oxford. Uh, the city of Manchester, I think, made a, a sustained effort to create them. But the 1944 Education Act which is always described as a tripartite system, never really made any provision. What it took, it, it took the old the existing state elementary schools and extended them up to 14 and 15 and to call them secondary moderns. And it took the existing grammar schools, which in many cases had long histories as semi-independent schools and absorbed them into the state system and made them fee-free. But the building of perhaps, I, I don't know, probably a thousand technical schools uh, was, was always an entirely theoretical thing. There was no legislation compelling authorities to do it. So I don't think, we can't even say that it failed. I think we can say that it, it proved difficult and expensive and wasn't tried. There was a lot of meanness in the way in which the 44 Act was implemented. Not much was done. And there quite, eventually quite a lot of money was spent on the secondary moderns, on buildings and, and, uh, and other things. But in general, they just took what they had uh, and they renamed an awful lot of it and, and rebadged it, and they, they made the, the elementary schools take pupils further up the age range. But that was about it. So it, it, it's never really tested. And I say, I've never seen any research on how the technical schools did. I, it, it seems to me to be a, a great pity that they weren't built, but I, I can't tell you. Right, very good. A final point. You have to keep your hand up, then the person with the microphone knows who it is. Take your hand up in the air. There you go. This gentleman here, no, with the, no, the green, sorry, mate. The one with the green band on. Apologies. 
Forgive me for not standing up. I've got a pinched nerve in my back. And it's because I'm so old that 52 years ago, when I was 10, I took a test called the 11, 11 plus and uh, I went to a state-funded grammar school. And um, I think my life experience very much reflects the, 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 um, the, the remarks that you make, Peter. Um, and I can't claim, claim to have been as distinguished at all as some of the people you mentioned, but... Uh, I had a decent academic career in the UK, Auckland, and Toronto. Um, I was uh, naively invited back to the UK at the end of my career to join one of Britain's post-92 universities. <laughs> and uh, I hadn't realised that I'd left academia when I did that because I hadn't realised that the post-92 universities weren't actually in it. Um, I, I come from a humble enough background, and I was surprised at the inverted class snobbery that I feel was projected onto the students. What I felt was the soft bigotry of low expectations. The observation that in the teaching excellence framework, the traditional universities still do far better than the post-92 universities, despite the claims to the contrary, and yet they still charge 9,000 a year to the students for the privilege of attending. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them, but if you want to look at Tony Croston's second mess on the carpet, <laughs> you might find that that's it. And we can't bring the grammar schools back, but I think there could be a lot to be said for dissolving the post-92s and doing something better for young people with the money. Oh, I so completely agree with you. Uh, it's been, it, it was extraordinary, and the contribution of the Conservative Party to this crisis in the form of John Major is, is enormous. Uh, but what you, it's part of the, the great response that you get uh, from the pro-comprehensive person, if anybody argues with me anymore, which few of them do after the first experience, I'm happy to say, but they, if, what they would often say is, but you have to understand, and Shirley Williams even made this comment shortly before she died, you have to understand that after the introduction of comprehensive school, so many more people had qualifications. <laughs> to which I reply, well, and in Germany in 1924, so many more people were millionaires. <laughs> but it does, it's not the point. So, yeah, I know, but the other, the other, the other point you, you make, of course, I draw attention to people like, such as Alan Bennett and Alan Rickman because it, it, it brings it home in a, in a rather moving way. Uh, but, of course, there were many, many more people whose lives were transformed in less spectacular ways than that, who had, as I say, much more fulfilled lives and had their talents much more properly used and had much better lives than they would have had under a comprehensive system. And it's what my grandparents would have wanted. You know? Yeah. And they had nothing. I know. And people, you, know, people, you, you talk to people in, in coal mining towns when we still have them, and they say we'd do anything to spare their children from going down the pit. Uh, and those schools were a route out of it, which again, does, the equivalent of going down the pit now, who knows what it is, being a security guard or something like that, but it, what, whatever it is, people would have a route out of it who don't have it now. Now the only route out of it is, is, if, you, is, is if your parents can buy an expensive house. Though I will point out, as I've written in the Mail on Sunday today, that Sir Michael Wilshaw, the great panjander of Ofsted, said an extraordinary thing last week. He said all the, the, when Ofsted says that 90% of schools are good or outstanding, it's rubbish. He's in, in a, so he, he, he ratnerized the, the whole state school system. <laughs> I, here I am, the former chief inspector of, of Ofsted, and I say the Ofsted verdicts on these schools are rubbish. He said, I, I see these reports on schools, and I think I should have gone to Specsavers school and eat pair of glasses. What are, they, what are they talking about? It isn't good even by their own standards. They don't even anymore really pretend that it was good. But I agree with you about the universities, but it is a, it, it's a consequence. What we have now... And I predicted it for many years. What we have now is almost, and this affects Oxford and Cambridge as well now, it's comprehensive universities. And the pressure on them to become more and more comprehensive is very, very strong. So where, what the, 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 the true elite, the really rich and powerful, where are they sending their children? They're sending them abroad to university now because uh, they, they know that they, first of all, they'd like to be rejected on the, on the grounds of social engineering. And secondly, they'll do better elsewhere. So it, it, that is another catastrophe. And when you think of the, the standing of, of, of those universities 60 or 70 years ago and the standing of them now, it's tragic. The destruction of valuable institutions. 
built up over centuries is very hard to watch. And it, but people, someone cuts down a sycamore tree on Hadrian's Wall, well, quite right, everyone's outraged by it. But we cut down metaphorical trees of far greater importance all the time in this country, and there's no fuss. Very good. Uh, right, uh, hang on. <laughs> so, look, very quickly, uh, the book is on sale in the bookshop. The book signing is next to the bookstall. It's perfect symmetry. Uh, please get a copy, uh, cheaper than half the price. It's basically, uh, I say, see here, spend £30 at the bookshop and get 10% off. Just buy two of these, you get 10% off. It, uh, it, so if they run out, I hate, I hate to suggest that this might happen, but if they run out, there is an alternative means of getting signed copies of this book, which is to telephone Blackwell's Bookshop in Oxford, and I will, if you order the book from them, I will go in to sign it. I say it if they run out, because the last time I went past a bookstall, they didn't have very many of them, but I just, it's, it is a thing that you can do, and I can get a signed copy to you if, you if you buy it from Blackwell's in Oxford. I will go in and sign it for you. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, that's an offer and a half.